Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and thank you for taking the time to be with us today. My name is Prasenjit Chakravarti and I am a partner in Khetan's m and practice group. On behalf of the firm, I would like to extend to each of you a very warm welcome to this webinar, whether you are in our audience in India or abroad. This is the fifth webinar in our m and Master Series in 2022 and we look forward to your company throughout the entire series. We have an excellent program this year based on feedback from participants in last year's series. We have been thrilled with the tremendous response to this year's series with literally thousands of registrations, webinars across the series. We are very grateful for the enthusiastic interest and support which our clients, associates and others have exhibited this year. Today, we are looking at how to do mergers and acquisition transaction by scheme of arrangement. On this slide is the agenda for today's webinar. In short, the format for today will be a presentation by restructuring experts, providing an overview of the topic, including a number of case studies to illustrate different m &A scheme structures, followed by a Q&A session with the audience questions. We've already received several audience questions in advance of this webinar. And if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to reach them during this webinar using the facility provided in the webinar portal. If you cannot cover all the questions during the webinar, rest assured we will respond to you separately offline by email after the webinar. Also, please note that after the webinar, you will receive a copy of the presentation, which will be presented during the course of today. Summary notes of the key issues discussed and link to the recording of the webinar. Today, we will discuss how to do m by schemes of arrangement. Typically, the focus in m a is on private bilateral m &As, transactions, open offers for listed companies. However, our topic focuses today on another different mechanism for achieving m a business objectives, and a very important one at that, which is receiving increasing traction and attention in the Indian m a landscape. In this webinar, we will be discussing advantages and disadvantages of doing m and transactions by scheme of arrangement, including corporate law, taxation, stamp duty, and other material issues which arise when dealing with such transactions. Now turning to our presenters of the day, our presenters today are my colleagues at Khetan and Company, Mehul Shah, who is a partner in the corporate and commercial law practice group, and Avin Bora who is the executive director with the corporate and commercial law practice group. Mehul and Bhavin are key members of Khetan's corporate restructuring group, which is the only dedicated law firm corporate restructuring group in India. The corporate restructuring group comprises of lawyers and chartered accountants who have extensive and diverse experience and expertise in delivering comprehensive restructuring services including conceptualization and implementation of m and transaction by scheme of arrangement. Every person who has registered for this webinar today has already received an email full particulars of the credentials of our expert speaker. So I will not spend much time repeating or summarizing their experience. Suffice to say, they are both restructuring experts in m and with excellent credentials. So without further ado, I would now like to invite Mehul and Bhavan to make their presentations. Thank you, Professor Jit. Uh, friends, all of us know that mergers and acquisitions uh, is one of the most common methods adopted by the corporate world in expanding and uh, carrying out the inorganic growth of their businesses. Conventionally, as we know, the mergers and acquisitions have been used by the corporate world for expanding their businesses from uh, with the existing for integrating, segregating, or acquiring businesses and for existing survival of their existing businesses that they have. With, with respect to, uh, you know, with the changing times and, and the increasing shareholders' uh, demands on, on better, uh, you know, better benefits from or better returns on, on the share, uh, their investment into the companies, the companies are required to think out of box solutions for the mergers and acquisitions and accordingly also required to keep the pace with the today's requirement. Conventionally, the mergers and acquisitions are generally undertaken 
by means of you know making investment into the companies or making a strategic investment into an existing company or doing an acquisition person to you know business transfer agreements or, or an asset transfer what this leaves with the existing companies or the acquiring companies is that you leave a company below that company and therefore it it creates a further management issues in terms of controlling multiple companies you already have a holding company you have a subsidiary or a company which is which you've acquired and therefore this leaves multiple challenges to that extent however when you look at the scheme transactions and and looking at the current situations or the transactions which have been undertaken recently by means of schemes like you know hindustan and glaxo hul glaxo transaction or inox pvr transaction or at the same time looking at ultratex acquisition of jp cement cement business or century textile cement business or looking at kn vedanta transactions including hdfc and hdfc bank transaction today all these transactions have been undertaken by means of a scheme and therefore we would want to understand what is a scheme scheme if if you know all of us are here would be aware that schemes are traditionally used as a mechanism to you know, to safeguard and to save tax uh, impact you know initially it used to have you know traditionally large industrial houses would have multiple companies some companies would have some profit some companies would have some losses they would either segregate or they would either you know either consolidate these companies and then set off the profits to the extent of the losses that you would have in in these companies but with the trending times and trending situations more and more evidence to that extent are being undertaken by means of schemes and therefore why you know to that extent what is a scheme you know right from 1913 companies act until 2013 companies act the concept of scheme has not undergone a change the scheme of arrangement where arrangement is not defined either in in any of the three acts that were there 1956 act 1913 act and 2013 act and therefore it leaves a wide canvas for for the companies and shareholders to determine the manner in which they would want to implement or you know color that canvas in the requirement they have depending on their objectives and requirements the courts right from you know the earlier days one would look at naujivan industries or manik chok or hindustan unilever you know tom co judgment to that extent courts have always held that schemes are a commercial contract between companies and its shareholders and and therefore you know it it becomes much more easier for companies to think through it's it it is treated as a single window clearance and therefore while one looks at a single window clearance it today the advisors are are trying to give a modern perspective to such such single window clearance today we can you know as as we as i mentioned multiple companies have undertaken mna transactions by means of 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 schemes we can also look at or in the past some large industrial houses have undertaken even succession planning by means of uh you know by by means of a scheme i would request having to talk about the benefits of a scheme uh that you know you have if you were to undertake schemes yeah thanks mehul uh, as mehul explained you know uh, off late the schemes have been used for multiple business purposes earlier you know, most of the time schemes were used for very narrow uh, objectives but now what we have seen is that different kind of objectives which can very easily be achieved through the schemes we have to look at the this spectrum of objectives which one can achieve through the scheme um so one of the objective is business combination uh, so if there is a group which has multiple businesses which have been acquired in the past if there are multiple entities which are doing the similar kind of businesses one of the easiest ways to consolidate the businesses without paying any taxes and by most paying very small or very minimal stamp duty is the doing the merger of all those entities So one of the simple ways to do a consolidation is to a merger scheme. The other objective is say, historically the business has been done in a single entity. Now because of the different commercial objectives, you have to segregate the different businesses, which has a different risk and reward. There will be some businesses, there will be a different kind of investor who will be ready to invest at a higher valuations. How do you segregate the businesses from an entity into a two different entity? Again, the merger is one of the ways where you can try and segregate the businesses, create two separate entities. house ha uh, house to different businesses into two different entities uh, for example hotlet what we are seeing is that sugar companies are looking at segregating the ethanol business from their sugar entity into a different entities because of the change in the business environment change of the policies where ethanol probably the ethanol business may have a different set of investor who may be ready to give 
are different valuations, different multiples for their businesses. Similarly, if you are looking at raising funds and if the structure is not conducive for the fundraising, either because the businesses are done in a multiple entities or there are multiple businesses in a single entity, and if investor is looking at only investing in a single entity, you can also consider schemes you know, to segregate the structure or create a structure which is conducive for fundraising. We'll discuss one of those structures when we discuss the case studies in the second part. Again, what we have seen in many groups is historically, you know, since people started groups, started investing, acquiring businesses, growing businesses, there have been multiple holding company, holding uh, multiple cross holdings which have been created between the groups. There have been intercompany loans, intercompany uh, investment which have been done in the group. Again, if you have to streamline the structure, create create a structure which is efficient for you know future fundraising or for uh, expansion in future. Again, schemes can be a vehicle which can be used for that. Uh, similarly, as I think Mehul explained, there have been multiple transactions which have been done through a scheme which effectively helps for inorganic growth. For example, Vodafone idea merger recently, I think PVR and INOX have also announced the merger. So there are transactions you know, where, which can be done through a scheme. The advantage of doing these schemes uh, is that you can you will be able to do a consolidation in a manner where there are no tax implications of consolidating those businesses. So like, for example, Vodafone idea merger, if one is to do a consolidate the businesses and look for a growth, that's an ideal structure which doesn't have any tax implications and you are able to achieve the consideration without you know without spending without spending a lot of cost in terms of transaction cost and stamp duty again um, the one of the other object which we have seen been done to the scheme is unlocking value uh, take an example there is a listed entity uh, which has multiple businesses which are done through a separate subsidiaries a uh, client is looking to do a or uh, list the one of the businesses without doing an ipo there is no requirement to or to raise funds, we don't want to do an IPO. And at the same time, when we do a separate listing, we want to ensure that the benefit of that is directly given to shareholders. It means shareholders end up owning those businesses separately post the restructuring. Again, doing a demerger from a listed entity and creating a separate business listed entities is possible without doing an IPO. The only way probably you can do an automatic listing without IPO is through a scheme. There are examples like you know starting from Reliance Industries, IFL. There are multiple groups who actually done a multiple listings without doing an IPO process, and that that's possible only through a scheme. Again, there are tax and stamp duty considerations which can also be achieved through the schemes. So you know overall there are multiple business objectives starting from consolidation, doing certain transactions as Mehul explained, on listing companies without IPO those. Are the objectives these are again you know few of the objectives which are explained and typically people feel schemes means merger or demergers but there are multiple types of restructuring which you can do through a scheme which we will explain in the subsequent scene. so thank you Brian. so again you know generally as the understanding between the common man is that schemes can we can only achieve mergers, amalgamations, or or demergers uh, under the scheme. What what we will we will show you and what what we can discuss here that what you can achieve under the scheme. If you were to ask us, uh, we as as part of the corporate restructuring team, we can tell you anything and everything is possible under the scheme. And to start with, in in a generic MA, you can only do a share purchase, share subscription, or 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 an asset asset purchase. You will not be able to do a capital restructuring, or you will not be in a position to do, you know, a, a debt restructuring, which otherwise can always be undertaken under the scheme. However, when we when we look at acquisitions or mergers and amalgamations, you know, mergers of course you can consolidate, but when you look at acquisition, you can also, as part of the scheme, do a business acquisition or share share acquisition. You can you can ask us, you know, whether whether the share purchase is possible. Yes, a share purchase is possible, and and. In the past, we can tell you examples like Vipro, Starlight, you know, Geometrics, Alembic, or or even even you know companies where just the share purchase were undertaken as part of the scheme and, and get away with with the takeover code requirements. There are there are informal guidance to that extent, and therefore you can also achieve share purchase as part of the scheme. Business acquisitions, yes, one can do a demerger, one can do a slump sale, one can do an asset sale. 
demergers are our best examples where you do a demerger and companies acquire these businesses or you demerge a particular business from 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 a listed entity to another listed entity or to an unlisted entity these structures are possible and it is the most tax efficient way of doing a transaction which in a share purchase becomes very difficult because to that extent you create another level below the existing or the acquiring layer which in a demerger would not be possible you just acquire that business into the company the shareholders gets the consideration and you do away with the two layer tax impact to that extent slump sale yes there is not very different between a slump sale that you would do under an agreement or you know in a bilateral contract versus a slump sale which you would undertake under the scheme but definitely we'll talk about the benefits that we'll have if you do it under the scheme asset sale is is as part of uh, uh, of 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 the 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 business transfer if one has to do it the, the important part and and which is one of the most important segment today if one were to look at is capital restructuring capital restructuring to that extent you can undertake uh, you know I, i'll go from you know where where you can do a capital uh, conversion of capital reserves today uh, after 2013 act came into the implementation the concept of general reserves have, has been taken away what today is possible to do is that the general reserve can be transferred to your retained earnings or, or profit and loss account which will enable the companies to utilize those funds for distribution to the shareholders or for further utilization now that you cannot do otherwise than a scheme number two you can do issuance of bonus shares bonus rps or bonus ncds yes definitely 2013 act permits you to do a bonus of preference shares but if you have a non-resident shareholder you will not be in a position to do it under automatic growth unless they are you know you are going to issue ccps to that extent as bonus if you were to issue redeemable preference shares uh, or optionally convertible preference shares you will have to go back to the rpf for seeking consent for issuing such uh, therefore the only way of doing that is you want to do a scheme of arrangement number two you can also do bonus debentures no companies that permit you to do debentures which can be issued as bonus you can do it under the scheme number two thereafter many a companies you know you issued preference shares as part of you know day-to-day -day operations as, as all of us know preference shares can only redeemable preference shares can only be redeemed out of profits existing profits of the company a securities premium account or from a fresh investment into the company in a situation where you are not able to achieve all three of them and you still need to give an exit to the preference shareholders you can always enter into a scheme and convert those preference shares into ncds and then that can be re that can be repaid in ordinary course of business without requiring the fresh capital or profits or or, or securities premium account to that extent number three you know the next uh, option by of capital restructuring is capital reduction you can do it under section 66 or under section 230 where capital reductions can also be used and in in today's world if you were to look at capital reductions have been used as a mechanism for squeezing out the minority shareholders or some minimal shareholders which have been left uh, post the delisting of the company many a times there have been companies where ESOPs have been issued to certain uh, the employees and after you know they they're not continuing with the company the employees continue to be part of of the ex company and you know as a shareholder not in their capacity as employees but still continue to hold all these shares the company may or may not wanting to continue them as, as shareholders and therefore and also to give liquidity to these shareholders it becomes much more easier to undertake these uh, activities you can of course do it under section 235 to 236 of the companies act but scheme to that extent has become one of the much more talked about instruments in 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 recent past buyback uh, unlike earlier times where you could undertake buybacks in, in any way uh, the companies act has restricted to undertake buyback under the scheme only if you were to follow the provisions of buyback rules and regulations to that extent and we, we, in, in view of this, what we believe is what you otherwise cannot do as part of uh, uh, you know conventional methods of MNAs. You can today undertake all these options under the scheme. But the next question that I would ask myself is that why would I want to undertake uh, such a complex process? You know, I, I would not say complex, but such a lengthy process to the extent if if I were to enter into a simple business transfer agreement or asset transfer agreement, or if I were to acquire a company, why would I want to you know, do a scheme process? Why would I not do in, enter into a simple bilateral agreement? Please understand, if I were to do a business transfer agreement or if I were to do a make investment into 
another company, I just have to pass a special reservations under Section 181A of the Companies Act or under Section 186 of the Companies Act. I don't have to run through this lengthy process. But then why would I want to do that? The, the answer to that is, is uh, there are a lot of advantages. This, of course, there are certain disadvantages that we can also talk about. But there are definitely far more advantages to that extent. One is sanctity to the tribunal approval, you know, of, of tribunal approval. A scheme, everybody is aware, a scheme is an, is an order uh, pursuant to which uh, or, or an instrument and the order of NCLT sanctioning such scheme becomes an instrument uh, pursuant to which the transfers are effected. It is an order in REM and therefore it is binding on all the parties. It becomes far more effective to the extent for implementations of, of, of regulatory approvals, transferring contracts, immobile properties. Unlike a bilateral contract, where the transfer would be effected only once the properties are mutated in favor of the companies. Sure, the mutations or transfer becomes much more as an administrative process rather than a compulsory requirement for a transfer. Retrospective effect. A bilateral contract can never implement a transaction retrospectively. Uh, companies at 2013 accept a concept of appointed date. It also accept you know, with, with Supreme Court in Marshalls have, have said you can have an appointed date which can be prospective. And therefore, while the effect of uh, transfer can take place only once the scheme has been sanctioned, but you can have it accounted in your books retrospectively. Whatever tax benefits one may want to think of by doing a retrospective effect, that can be thought through. Corporate governance. A scheme to that extent is a public document. It, it is subjected to scrutiny by uh, not only the, the audit committees, the, the, the boards, the, the committee of independent directors, the shareholders, the creditors, but also by regulators. SEBI stock exchanges have to give their no restrictions to that. In, in addition to these, the sectoral regulators also have to bless the scheme to that extent in, in, in terms of the provisions of the Companies Act. They are required to issue notices to the sectoral regulators. They are required to give, bless the scheme. The central government through the regional director are required to bless the scheme. And therefore, to that extent, it is much more, uh, you know, favorable uh, for the corporate governance point of view. Ease of transfer, definitely, you know, the licenses that the company would hold, it, it is much more, it's just a novation of these licenses which, which are issued. Yes, there are, when we speak about the regulatory framework, we will talk about this far more in detail on the licenses that the company would hold. Uh, accession benefits. Uh, if you were to do a merger, if you were to do a demerger, these are purely tax neutral in the hands of shareholders. There are a lot of tax benefits if, if done in accordance with the Income Tax Act. Regulatory exemptions. As we were talking about schemes where, uh, you know, like, like Dharampur Sugar Scheme, where the shares were transferred between two set of shareholders under the scheme without affecting the takeover code uh, open offer. Uh, if we can save in terms of certain exemptions which are available under the scheme, we can definitely look at why not to take transactions in the scheme. Say, for example, if it's a change in control, say we take over code, definitely exempts if a change in control is happening pursuant to a scheme. Therefore, these are the exemptions which, which are available to you only if you were to execute a trans transaction under the scheme and not in, in, in ordinary, uh, you know, in, in the conventional method of MA. Reduce transaction cost. A business transfer agreement, say for example, uh, you know, business transfer agreement. If I were to look at or any transaction which we were to do that, the if you were in a simple conveyance, you will still end up paying stamp duty at at the value at which the each of the states would with the immobile properties would have situated. In in schemes, majority of the states now have caps to the stamp duty which are required to be paid. In Bombay, it is 50 crores. In MP 25 crores, in Chennai it is, it is 20, 25 crores, in Andhra Pradesh 20 crores, uh, you have Gujarat 25 crores, of course Rajasthan has the highest cap of 200 crores, but you do have a cap there. And if you see that you are going to reach uh, that threshold, you are definitely going to reduce the significant cost, which is the biggest, uh, you know, criteria to be, you know, to be thought through by the corporate world when, when you are looking at a transaction. Now, when we say there are certain advantages, what are the key considerations one need to look at when you are looking at these advantages side at the same time? Timeline. As, as I started conversing on this is, is about timeline. With, with today's time, a listed company involved in the scheme easily would take about 9 to 12 months of time to have a scheme implemented. If, if we 
because and this is not because of the regular timeline which are there Cebu would generally take about two to three months of time whereas uh, you know the NCLT because of the IBC matters and 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 the, the not having a full quorum in each of the NC, you know NCLTs it the process generally is taken a bit like four to six months uh, to that extent uh, the corporate approval thresholds uh, in a lot of cases you know as a business transfer if you were to do under the scheme you would need a majority of minority whereas if, if you do it under under the companies act you just need a special resolution where the promoters can vote where under the scheme you won't be able to do it there's a larger threshold plus you know in, in the schemes you are required not only required to pass a special resolution but you also are required to have majority on numbers uh, to vote in favor of the scheme that is another issue which are there further the the document is available or the scheme is available for scrutiny by peers your competitors the public at frame the regulators and therefore it becomes far more open-ended to an extent than a bilateral contract but one will have to definitely weigh down the 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 advantages and and the disadvantages to that extent the the next question that i would ask myself is that okay i have looked at the benefits i have looked at the conventional method of of undertaking an enemy i have looked at scheme i have looked at the benefits of the scheme I have also looked at the manner in which that scheme can be looked at or if any acquisition if any merger and acquisition transaction if i were to look at i also look at the manner in which i can do that now therefore i also have to consider the regulatory framework i would say companies act is is the central pillar of of the scheme and because the scheme stems out of companies act it being there there are two immediate pillars to those center table is sebi and stamp duty laws why sebi and and i would want to go back to 2006 7 where you know a large uh, company in india had undertaken an offshore acquisition and and the cost of acquisition to of that uh, was was debited to the securities premium account under the accounting treatment under a scheme sebi at that point in time for the first time had introduced the concept of a certificate from an auditor stating that if any scheme has been undertaken that has to confirm that the accounting standards is in accordance with the, the 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 accounting standards applicable to that company and a statutory record is required in addition to that as the time fly there were there were convoluted schemes which which you know which certain companies are had undertaken and with with that the parties definitely thought through and, and sebi especially came out with a sebi circular which which brought in the concept and restrictions that under what manner the schemes can be undertaken what is the way a company for listed companies in what what all things it need to follow it initially started with audit committee approving valuation report it slowly steadily brought in the concept of uh, you know the the uh, you know uh, the committee of independent directors approving the scheme it also brought in the concept of now of lately the last of the requirement is that the secured creditors at least 75 percent of secured creditors need to have an approval before they give their nocs slowly steadily to that extent sebi has also started taking over the or plugging the loopholes which uh, you know the advisors or, or the companies started using which were otherwise available similarly like sebi stamp duty laws were also introduced initially there was a cap in maras of 25 Rajasthan also initially started with 25 crores people realized that you know people would go to those states and, and and implement schemes with the mobile properties large mobile properties and still end up paying stamp duty only of 25 crores they plug that loophole and brought in and in, increase the cap but you still have a cap unlike you know any other uh, you know any other provision on the stamp pack income tax you know even income tax authorities realize that the transactions have been undertaken for being tax neutral they introduce that if you have a commercial rationale for it yes you can get out of the car but you still have uh, to that extent provisions which can safeguard the, the loopholes or, or the creativity that is thought through by the by the advisors and and, and the teams rbi iida uh, dot all of these entities uh, you know all of these regulators which are have become very very uh, strict to an extent of of implication but at the same time because of more and more emanes we started you know to be undertaken by means of schemes these regulators have also started accepting schemes as a method and therefore have legislated regulations around the scheme and, and or relating to the scheme and therefore any acquisition any transfer or license you are required to approach these regulators and have that approved 
once you once you've cleared the regulatory framework as well and we we now have a certainty that yes if i were to undertake a scheme uh, if i were to do this acquisition i would definitely sail through all of this then we will one will have to look at what is the uh, approval uh, to that extent or what is the processes that need to be followed once we have the commercial objective freezed once we have the cost uh, assessment freezed one will have to start evaluating the valuations and you know if it's a listed company which is involved a value registered valuer and a merchant banker need to be appointed to that extent for for considering the fairness of the valuation that the valuers will determine the, the scheme is then required to be placed before the audit committee uh, the independent committee of independent directors and board for its approval if it's a listed company and if it is regulated by sectoral regulator you need to definitely approach uh, sebi and and through stock exchanges and an rbi or irda or whichever regulator you are regulated with for seeking in principle approval from them sebi definitely gives an noc now unlike the observation letter like earlier passed but once you have the observation only then you can approach the nct for seeking sanction to that extent sebi uh, cci has definitely uh, you know diluted its stand to say yes you can approach us before before the scheme getting effective the earlier 30 day timeline has now been taken away we can approach at any point in time before the scheme becomes effective before the cci but one will have to still approach the cci with with nclt process which is pretty set process where the the shareholder creditors the official liquidator if it's a merger the central government provisional director uh, you know the roc the income tax authorities all need to give their reports the, the, they need to file their reports before the nclt is basis which the nclt will will consider the scheme and and then sanction the scheme to that extent after the final hearing to that effect the, the scheme one sanction and made effective it needs to be implemented to that effect uh, and on the basis of the way it is provided for in the scheme having said that i would definitely want to mention here that if it's it is not a acquisition or a group reorganization people today more often than not enter into an implementation agreement which is also approved at a time when the scheme is approved and therefore implementation agreement captures all other provisions like you would generally have in a share purchase or a share subscription agreement which would provide for the reps and warranties indemnities uh, which which are given by the transferring company or the respective companies to the to the extent of the businesses that are getting merged or consolidated so so therefore you know what you can otherwise achieve in a scheme uh, or in, in a conventional method of mna you can definitely achieve that in 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 a, in a scheme you can achieve much more frankly in a scheme than what you would otherwise do in a in a conventional approach of mna uh, what we've done is we've, we've had some case studies as as kasinjit also mentioned uh, bhavin will walk us through some interesting cases you know trust me uh, these are these are very very interesting cases and and i would want bhavin uh, to explain or walk us through uh, these these case laws for us Yeah, thanks. So you know the first case study is you know yeah. So you know if you look at the structure, there is an entity which has two businesses, business A and business B, currently own 100% by the promoters. There is an investor who is ready to do a joint venture for one of the businesses. So he is not interested in both the businesses. He is only interested in doing the joint venture only for business A. The funds are immediately required for expansion of businesses. So we don't want to wait for the the segregation of businesses to happen and then the investment happening. We want to ensure that the funds come immediately in the company so that the same can be used for the expansion of the businesses immediately. One of the ways, you know, the first question, probably the first thing which comes to mind is, can I just simply do a slum sale? I slum sell the business to a business transfer agreement from operating company to a newly formed company. The investor can put money in that entity because of the way the Income tax regulation has been amended recent, in the recent past. Slum sale has its own challenges. There may be tax implication when the business is transferred by way for slum sale from the existing entity to a new entity. As Mayul mentioned, the scam duty implication would most of the cases would be higher in a slum sale versus if you do any other structuring. And there are if there are certain licenses which are there in these businesses, it becomes difficult to transfer those licenses to a new company if you have to do a slum sale to a business transfer agreement. So the question is, if I have to consider an option which kind of minimizes or mitigates the consideration which are there in slum sale, can I look at an alternate structure? The one of the structure which probably we can explore is 
let an investor put money in the operating company in the form of compulsory convertible debentures so that the funds come into a company immediately you can start using that for business sale the all the commercial arrangement which is there between promoter and investor uh, as far as business a is concerned can very well be captured in this shareholder agreement which can be executed between the promoter and investor including the reserve matters where the certain decisions with respect to business a cannot be taken without the written consent of investor once the money has been invested as a next step uh, we can do a demerger of business from operating company into a new company so business a along with the ccds which investors includes in opco can be demerged into a new fund opco can issue shares to the promoters as a part of demerger once the demerger is complete the ccds which have been moved to a new co can be converted into equity to achieve a desired equity holding between promoter and investor if you are able to do a structure uh, through a ccd and a demerger route there will be no tax implications on transfer of business either from opco into new co or on if you know funds as ccds potentially you will be able to save on the stamp duty cost or minimize the stamp duty cost And if there are any approvals which are required, it's easier to get those approvals transferred to a new co because of the tribunal approving the scheme, which is easier to to explain to any regulator. So if we have to now look at what are the key considerations, a few of the key considerations as we explained, this demerger will obviously require the approval of NCL and other regulator. We need to look at the stamp duty implications on demerger, and there should not be any tax implications of doing this structure. I think now move to the other case study. Uh, look at a scenario. There are two set of promoters. There is a promoter who is already owning the stake in a listed entity, and there is another set of promoter who has a business which is 100% owned by a promoter which is not listed. Now there is an objective that Lisco wants to acquire the business which is owned by a, owned by a target by issuing its own shares. But since Lisco is in a different business and the target is in a different business. Commercially, I don't want that business to get merged with the Lisco business. The objective is that that business should remain under the wholly owned subsidiary of Lisco. But at the same time, when I'm doing that structure, I don't want to pay any cash consideration to promoter. I want to issue the shares of Lisco as a consideration to promoter. And if we have to do this in a tax and a regulatory efficient manner, what is the structure available? One of the ways uh, in which this can be done is can we consider the demerger of business? From a target entity into a wholly owned subsidiary set up by a Lisco, so the business moves from a target into a wholly owned subsidiary. So the objective of having the business into a separate subsidiary can be achieved. As a consideration for that demerger, under the income tax law, it's possible that instead of the subsidiary which is receiving the business, its parent entity, in this example, is a Lisco, can issue its own shares to the promoter. So when you do a demerger of business. Business will move to a boss, but instead of boss issuing shares, its parent, which is a Lisco, will issue shares to the promoters, by which you can achieve the commercial objective of issuing a consideration in the form of issuer shares, and at the same time ensuring that the business still remains in the boss. Uh, if you have to look at again the key consideration when we do this structure or transfer the business through a demerger route, there are no tax implications either for target Lisco or any of the promoters. It's a tax. Efficient way of you know consolidating the business from target into a listco. You will obviously since the listed entity is required, you will require the approval of SEBI and stock exchange in addition to tribunal and other regulatory approvals. And one of the added advantage of this structure is even if the promoter end up owning a substantial stake in listco, you will do you don't need to do a open offer since the issuance of shares is pursuant to a demerger. Uh, the open offer or the takeover code doesn't trigger. So that's also an added advantage of doing this structure through a demerger route. Uh, if we now move to the the other case study, and what we have seen this uh, very much happening in a real estate and an infrastructure sector is, say there is a non-resident investor or a private equity who wants to acquire a target entity which is engaged in a real estate or infrastructure business in India. He is Is able to raise funds or a leverage take a borrowing outside India. So he has the lenders outside India who are ready to fund this acquisition, but they want the comfort that once the acquisition is done, the funds which are available in target can very easily be repatriated to outside India to repay the loan which is taken by a private equity or a non-resident investor outside India. If we, if a non-resident investor simply acquires the shares of target, 
then there will be constraints or limitations on repatriating funds from target to a foreign shareholder either under the companies and because of the limitations around how much dividend you can pay or how much you can repatriate personal to buy back there could be challenges under companies act and as well as income tax on repatriating those funds is there an alternate way available where the funds the loan which has been taken outside india can be pushed down into a target in some manner so for example probably one of the structure which you can explore is let that investor set up an entity in india say spv you capitalize that entity in a right equity and debt mix so for example say if i to acquire or pay 100 dollars to acquire a target say i invest one third of that money as equity in spv i invest two third of that money in the form of non convertible debentures uh, which is invested by a non resident investor into an spv with that money spv will acquire 100% stake in a target entity so that the promoter gets immediate exit he doesn't need to wait for any other restructuring to happen and as soon as the target has been acquired by spv you initiate a process for merger of target with spv which means the moment spv has acquired 100% shares of target you collapse the uh, target entity by merging it into an spv by doing that you are able to create a structure where an investor will own a single entity in india where the business has already moved to an spv and spv has a non convertible debt issued to an investor so as in when there are surplus funds irrespective of that company has a surplus written earnings or not you can simply redeem those ncds or pay coupon to those ncds which can go to a investor which can be used to repay a loan taken outside india obviously there are certain consideration which we need to consider one of the biggest advantage of this is a debt has been pushed down into an entity where the business is which means it's easier to repay our surplus funds to an investor or uh, there are no tax implications or not significant stamp duty implications when you to merge target with an spv even in the states like maharashtra when you merge a 100% subsidiary with parent even if there are substantial involved properties in the target entity the stamp duty payable on the loss merger is effectively nil you don't need to pay any stamp duty when you merge a 100% subsidiary with parent in the state of maharashtra one also need to look at the certain compliances which needs to be done for issuance of ncds the foreign investor need to obtain a foreign portfolio investor which is fpi registration with sebi and there are certain end use restrictions and a certain other compliances which one need to look at uh, under the fema regulations and uh, if you go to the next structure now the other structure uh, is can i if there is a listed entity and if i want to deal is part of the business or i want to give some liquidity or an exit option to public shareholders can i do that if there is some business which is non core to a listed entity business can i kind of deal is that business give an exit opportunity to public shareholder uh, again you know one of the ways where we can deal is the business is to do a demerger from listed entity of that non core business into an an unlisted entity as a part of the demerger we will give multiple options to shareholders for example we can give them an option to say you can continue as a equity shareholder in an unlisted entity or we will issue a redeemable preference which is equivalent to a value of that business which would be listed which means the public shareholders can then trade in those redeemable preferences and get a liquidity option or as i think may will explain at the start the share transfer is also possible which means if we issue an unlisted equity to the public shareholder we can give an option where those unlisted equity shares would be acquired by the promoters and they will give a cash exit to the public shareholder so multiple options can be given to the shareholders and by which we are able to delink or de delist the non core business from listed entity into a new core there are obviously precedents available where uh, wipro and starlight technologies has taken this route to give an exit to the public shareholders uh if you have to uh we can skip the key considerations and the key considerations are broadly the same as we discussed earlier for the demerger options first it requires certain approvals and demergers are tax noted if we go to a last case study and this is little interesting is that if i there is a real estate business which which is done by one developer we want to transfer that business to another developer if that two ways to do that transfer either i can do this transfer through a slum sale or i can do this transfer through a a slum sale through a scheme so slum sale can also be done in a two manner they can do a slum sale through a business transfer agreement or through a scheme if we do a slum sale through a business transfer agreement in a business where the substantial values are in the form of immobile properties you end up incurring a lot of stamp duty cost 
typically the stability cost ranges between 5 to 8 percent depending on the state and that becomes a very huge cost when you do a slum cell through a BTN. Or uh, in most of the states, if you are able to do a slum cell through a scheme, the stamp duty gets reduced either to a very nominal value or will reduce significantly from compared to the slum cell through BTA. So the another structure where the schemes have been used is to minimize the stamp duty, which is payable on slum cell. You are still doing a slum cell. All other tax and other considerations still remains the same. But instead of doing it through a business transfer agreement, you are doing it through a scheme which will give you a any advantage of a minimum or a very reduced stamp duty cost on the or in case of a slum cell. So I think that's we end on the case study. We can now go to the QA. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Bhavin and Mehul, for this very insightful uh, presentation so far, uh, along with the lovely case studies. I think I've got a, a flurry of questions actually, so which is pouring in from audience members and and let me see which one uh, should I lob first. I think it's a very interesting question actually. Can an Indian scheme or company be used, uh, you know, to 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 acquire foreign companies or foreign assets? Uh, through the route of scheme arrangement, and if so, are there any bottleneck challenges you perceive in that? See, cross-border merger regulations have been framed. You know, Section 234 of the Companies Act permit uh, cross-border mergers, and and one will have to look at the jurisdiction where the, the the company offshore is situated. But at the same time, while while there are regulations, you know, there would be difficulties in terms of uh, the the compliances. So. An inward merger to that extent is possible, subject to the FEMA regulations. Like if you have an immobile property sitting outside that company, you will need to take you know either uh, you know uh, an office licensing office registration or or some kind of other registrations that you may want to have there. But at the same time, having acquiring a company outside India under a scheme. Uh, and issuing considerations in India, there's still some work to be done at under the FEMA regulations. Uh, not yet. Uh, we are not yet there to have these implications or to have these transactions completed. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, okay, so I think let's move to another question. This is from Devashish Parmar. I think uh, it's an interesting question in the sense. I think somewhere we mentioned that if you know a scheme is a single window uh, kind of a you know, for MNA activity. So the question is then why do people do BTAs, you know, outside the scheme? Uh, if it's so seamless and a single window, then why at all BT? So I, I think it, it would be far more on, on, you know, this question I would want to ask uh, to, to the people who do BTAs. The reason for that is timeline. I would I would look at it in a simplicity timeline point of view and also other other compliances. If, if frankly speaking, if if say for example if i were to do an acquisition or business uh, transfer or business acquisition of, of a company which has immobile properties say in maharashtra or gujarat for thousands of crores i would definitely not advise to do a bta under a bilateral contract but i would want to do it uh, under under uh, a scheme the simple reason for that is in if i were to go under the scheme it's one percent stamp duty or five percent of immobile property in maharashtra but with a cap of, of 50 crores in Gujarat, it is still 25 crores. You know, of course, Andhra Pradesh is 20, and Telangana is 20. All the states have, have caps. If I were to do a BTA, I would end up paying, you know, 5% of 1,000 crores in each of these states. Why would I do that? So it it it's, it all depends on 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 the the, the cost allocation that people have done. Uh, if the mobile property is small, uh, you don't have much of a regulatory hurdles. Uh, you know, uh, one can see if there's a, a subsidy which is existing in a company, you want to have that subsidy also to be transferred as part of the scheme. Uh, you may definitely want to do a sanctioned scheme. You know, you take an NCLT approved scheme to the regulator to say, look, uh, this, this undertaking talks about uh, the subsidy also forming part of it. And therefore, I will want to have this sanction. So with that, you show it and the subsidy gets transferred. You know, so therefore, their bilateral contracts may not work and it is the scheme which will do it. To that extent, right. I think no surprises that Mehul as the scheme expert obviously prefers scheme. I think uh, no surprises there. So, so, so there's the answer there to that question. Though I think another question now. This is Mehul and Bhavin to the case study you ran. I think one question is, uh, 
you know that isn't there any uncertainty or risk of a scheme being rejected or prolonged in your experience have you seen a scheme being rejected or or uh, going on and on you know and kind of uh, for protracted timelines so so prasijit in, in in my experience of last 20 24 years uh, i'm yet to see a scheme being rejected yes there is your for movies there is uh you know pajanta pharma there are one of two schemes which you can count but the inclat has sanctioned it you know the nclts have you know rejected schemes unless and until you know the this the object of the scheme is against the public policy the schemes will get rejected and and i, I haven't seen during the high court regime any schemes getting rejected there would be one or two because of the shareholders or creditors not approving it uh but not for uh the uncertainty portion that nclt will not approve it to that extent it's a settled principle of law that it's a commercial contract between the companies and its shareholders and creditors and once the shareholders and creditors have approved it uh you know the courts uh, should not apply it commercial wisdom to to look at it that's that's what the supreme court says it's a different story when when you go on the ground but i am yet to see a scheme which got rejected because of certain you know uh, you know certain reasons which are not uh you know on 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 grounds of regulations right so i think i think it's fair to presume if the intents of bona fides and, and you know are all genuine and good i think this seldom a scheme is get rejected i mean uh that's that's how i would also imagine i think there's a question for bhavan specifically uh, bhavan this is for the case study you you were running uh, its question is that uh, you mentioned the shares will be issued by the parent company a uh, pursuant to demerger is this a tax compliant demerger yeah so you know again the way the demerger definition of the resulting company definition has been provided under the income tax act the resulting company says the resulting company would include either the company which is getting the business or its wholly owned subsidiary so both parent and the subsidiary are considered as a resulting company and for a demerger to be compliant resulting company needs to issue shares so once you are able to explain that both the entity which is in the case study listco and a was both of them are considered as a resulting company any company can issue shares to comply with the demerger definition and that we have been in the past this has been deliberated a lot with many of the senior counsels and the the conclusion is that even if the parent company which is 100% shareholder of the entity receiving a business issues shares to a de, to the shareholders of demerge company that demerger should be tax compliant and there are precedents where people have implemented this kind of schemes in the past right right that's that's very helpful bhavin thanks for that mehul one for you now uh, you know this is uh, saying in one of the case study business was demerged uh, from a listed entity without the resulting company being listed uh, has something like this been approved by uh, sebi in the past uh, yes yes pc in fact um, we were the first ones to do it in starlight uh, you know when we did that there was a 21 page observation letter it is still there we still went ahead uh, you know while say we cannot reject it they can only give their observations and again with the settled principle of law that it's a commercial contract between company and shareholders uh, if the shareholders approve it uh, it the you know the share, the court even did not look at it so you know uh, this was way back in 2014 15 of course high court regime thereafter similar structures were implemented by geometrix it was implemented i think the last was olympic pharma a few more companies have implemented it and they have taken the thing sebi what 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 sebi did was when 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 the starlight was 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 had gone before sebi there was no concept of majority of minority there were only three conditions then the condition number 4 and 5 that we see today for taking majority of minority and especially the fifth condition had culminated because of this scheme where they said that if the if the equity shares on demerger or transfer of an undertaking is not by means of of uh, listed equity shares then you need to take a majority of minority satellite we did not even take a majority of minority and and therefore you know that was what they they plucked in uh, you know in in the next sebi circular that was issued uh, by by the sebi right that's that's it. for i think next one is slightly tricky one i think uh this is from amit joshi kotak uh, because of longer timelines uh, you know do companies need to revalue and get fresh valuation reports see frankly the valuation reports when the valuations are undertaken you do it as on the date of the board meeting and it all depends what is your appointed date what is your effective date 
also at that same time if you look at the sops issued by the stock exchanges and and sebi uh, on the valuation you know in relation to the you know if you look at the master circular 22nd november 2021 i think so it provides that the valuation you know how the valuation methodology is required to be adopted you know while the you know supreme court had definitely laid down the process uh safe is also provided for the process how you will do the valuation and what all methodologies you need to provide what all rationals you need to provide for it it is there so if that is there and and you have not wasted time uh, to that extent uh and it will all depend on you know the commercial arrangement between the parties if you have a retrospective date obviously no valuation if it's a prospective date uh, uh you know I, I won't be able to comment too much on it but if you know it will all depend how commercially uh, the parties have negotiated on the valuation to that extent but uh, to that if you ask in in all these transactions which are existing you know there are transactions which are continuing for last one and a half years two years no revaluations have been done the same valuations continue it holds good so just as a you know kind of sequel to that let's say there is a material adverse change uh, in one entities which is getting merged uh, then also will you uh, not kind of revisit the valuation uh, because of course the parties agreed to a certain valuation when launching the team uh, but of course there is a material adverse effect to either let's say because of covid or any other factors impacting the revenue stream financials uh in those circumstances uh, of course as you rightly said it's not a hard and fast or engraved in stone one has to look at multiple factors and then perhaps decide uh but but what's your view that party should be prudent to at least take a call uh, after evaluating uh, any adverse impact so you see again it, it will be you know how commercially we have agreed for it so any variation to the scheme and and again you know one of the modifications to the sebi circular that was again thanks to us you know we we approved a scheme where with with a particular ratio in between we changed the ratio of the scheme and 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 then went to the shareholders sebi said what nonsense you know and therefore they introduced one more provision as part of the sebi circular to say any variation to the scheme you need to come back to us and therefore if you were to if you were to do any change or if you were to modify the the you know the valuation You'll have to start the process again. You'll have to go back to SEBI. You'll have to explain that. You'll have to amend the scheme if it is already before the NCLT. Uh, you'll have to amend your scheme. You'll have to, you know, the NCLT may direct you back to the shareholders to say you go back to the shareholders, take their approval. So it's a long run process. Unless and until your scheme provides for an adjustment, you know, if, if in the scheme more often than not uh, you you would think for uh, you know an adjusted timeline that if there is an adjustment which is required, you can never do. an upward adjustment but you can always do a downward adjustment and therefore if that is well provided for in the scheme uh, you know you don't need to go back to say you can do that adjustment on your own i understand that's that's very helpful thanks mehul uh, next question d yasasweni from hawkins cooker uh, i think what uh, it mentioned that we have spoken a lot about the benefits of schemes can you point out few disadvantages of adopting a scheme two three disadvantages maybe uh see again you know if you look at that slide there were three disadvantages what we written there one was the timeline you know in 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 a commercial contract you could finish a contract in you know execute uh, cps to be completed cs to be done and and done in just in 2 3 months of this time uh in a scheme this this process if it is a listed company it won't have any certainty uh, trust me a uh, few nclts uh, you know it takes more than a year to have the scheme effective you know there are few ncds few ncds are superb you know you can complete the scheme in 3 to 4 months of time even today so so that was one of the issue the second is your peers your competitors everybody are are you know know what you are doing in in a bilateral contract it is suddenly one day you will make a disclosure in in public domain to say i have done this i have executed therefore there is nobody who is trying to do or fidget with something there uh third was Uh, more in terms of uh, you know what what we would say is is the far more the thresholds are higher um, you know you don't need uh, to an extent a separate audit committee approval if you were to look at uh, an acquisition or a bta to be executed it's a simple contract audit committee needs to look at valuation not more than that you need a special resolution you don't need a 3/4th in value plus uh, you know majority numbers voting in favor so even you may have 
three fourth in value voted in favor of you, but the numbers don't tally, your scheme does not go through. Uh, you don't need creditors' consent. Here you need creditors' consent as well, secured, unsecured, both. Uh, in addition to that, uh, you are also, if it's a it's a listed company, you are subjected to majority of minority, which which you would not do that in a bilateral contract. Your promoters would be able to vote. Here, your their votes won't be counted when when the majority of minority has been done. So therefore, you know, if you were to ask me, this is the biggest disadvantage. And with the increased shareholder activism, uh, you know, if they believe that, uh, you know, it's a really, really creative scheme, uh, you have tried to, you know, not, I'm not saying that uh, you've tried to take the minority shareholders on ride, you know, for a ride, but you have really brought in something different in the scheme. Uh, and, you know, the, the, uh, shareholder activism and suddenly rise up. The proxy advisors will have the reports, uh, you know, and and then you know people will start running around. So, uh, so I think that is one you know disadvantage in today's world. Uh, I would put it. Yeah. No, that's that's very right. I think, I think obviously gay, gets public gaze also. I think uh, once you start uh, doing scheme, and I think uh, again there are a lot of questions of common theme i see in the chat box uh, regarding alternate options besides scheme and all let's see look from my experience also whenever we plan a restructuring a one size will never fit all like in most cases you will have to do an analysis of uh, asset transfer business transfer share transfer a demerger merger depending on what the objective is how much time you have in mind uh, uh, how much you want to go public how much tax can you possibly get classes of assets uh, stand duty you incur or save all of this will have to be factored in before you can conclude so i think it's uh, at that unfair to say uh, or ask rather ki, look only schemes are better schemes are not good it's a question of uh, analysis and evaluating in each case depending on the facts of the case so i think that's that's what i have seen as well so a lot of these i think questions were resonating so i just thought of kind of clarifying that uh, one question of stamp duty again i know this is a very complicated subject given a state issue so how is you know stamp duty computed for properties situated across states in a scheme so let's say there are uh, high value real estate manufacturing plants scattered all over india uh, how do you tackle the stamp duty menace there i see the way all of us know here stamp duty you know there is coming out of the concurrent list that you have, the state list, the, the concurrent list, and the union list. Uh, some portions are, are where you need to pay stamp duty arising out of, you know, in, in what you need to pay to central government. But each state, in relation to the properties which are situated within their state, are, are required to uh, provide for how the stamp duty is going to be charged. Now, if you have properties in multiple states uh, with the orders of, of the way you have the precedence today, and, and especially with Hero Motors order, uh, every state is eligible, and especially where the state has a specific entry of scheme. And if you want to take benefit of that entry, uh, they would be entitled to charge stamp duty on the entire consideration value. This is a debatable issue, uh, but if you were to ask, uh, a lot of questions, a lot of debates, a lot of opinions were actioned has been taken. Uh, you do the concept. Every state has, uh, you know, section 19 or section 18, which talks about giving a set off only a differential duty to be paid. Uh, no state is willing to do that. Suddenly, every state has realized that stamp duty is the easiest source of revenue uh, uh, from from the corporates, and and therefore, uh, you know, trust me, it is the most difficult ask uh, to implement. And this issue is not just scheme. You know, scheme is the lesser evil you, you do it a bilateral contract you will still end up having the same issues uh, but uh, you know uh, i would still want to take the benefit to say yes it is person to the order it has got transferred uh, i'm just saying that you know value of property situated in such state and uh, you know i'll deal with it as and when the order comes i may want to clean set off as well uh, if there's a significant amount that i need to clean as a set off right that's a i think very good answer to a rather complicated question i think uh, i'm mindful of the time but i will try and squeeze in few more questions before we go to take this conclusion poll slide uh, so please stay tuned for for that i think the next question which i would like to ask uh, every quick i think answer would be if there are different classes of shares do you need uh, 75 percent vote of each class of shareholders or only one class of shareholder which is the dominant shareholder uh, again, you know, what is that class? If it is 
So there's preference shares, there are equity shares. Equity shares have differential voting rights, and you know, and, and you know, just an equity share. It will all mean, you know, if their rights are impacted. But the way the sections are, uh, is to section 230 is provided for. It is class of the members and and class of creditors, and therefore each class will have to convene. Uh, you'll have to convene meetings of each of the classes, and 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 therefore resolutions will need to be passed or approved by each of them. Right. Uh, so last question. I'm very sorry. Uh, there are a barrage of questions. We, as I mentioned at the outset, we will get back to you in writing to each one of you, which we we haven't done so far in, in the webinar. If you haven't taken any questions, I think this is again from Amit uh, Joshi Kotak. Any restrictions on raising funds they took you while merger scheme? Um, see, it will all again. So Amit, uh, frankly, if you see. Few of the precedents I can name it for you here is is IFL scheme or uh, you know IFL mega demerger or restructuring which was undertaken or you can look at uh, Grassi Maritya Birla and Aditya Nuo scheme. Uh, also there were other schemes uh, which we are, we are working on. There's a specific entry uh, and a provision in the scheme where we've said that while the scheme is in process we will raise up to five percent ten percent of of the capital at a value. What you need to be mindful of is that the capital that you are going to raise in that company should be at a value which is higher or equal to the base price which was considered for the share swap in the scheme. So, so there is no bar unless and until you provided for that in the scheme and, and appropriate undertakings at the time of filing uh, being made under Regulation 37 of LODR with the stock exchanges that are taken care of. Right, right, Mabel. So I think uh, just moving on, I think. Uh, to take away now, I think Behul, uh, if you can encapsulate and summarize all the discussions in you know five bullet points in, in a couple of minutes or so, uh, can you do it to the audience before we head to a poll and conclusion? So, uh, definitely. So, you know. Um, you know, takeaways. You know, we, we, we've discussed, and, and frankly speaking, you know, uh, with with the limited time available, it is very very difficult to discuss this kind of topics with case laws in in 40 45 minutes of time. Uh, but with whatever best we could do was we could squeeze in as much as possible, and 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 talk about uh, the subject. So you know, first is that when any you know, if you have an image in front of you and you were to look at. One would be is that I would start thinking and start asking questions. What are my business objectives? You know, if the objectives are clear, uh, the cost efficiency has been thought through. You know, whether the stamp duty liability in a in a regular BTA versus uh, you know a scheme, or even if you were to look at a regular share purchase or a share subscription to that extent versus a demerger or a consolidation, if that was thought through, and if you are ready to undertake, you know, companies below you. You have the cost efficiency exercise done. You have also looked at the legal framework, regulatory framework, and, and the regulatory framework, say for example, DOT regulations, or, or to that extent, uh, some more regulations like SEBI regulations, which specifically permits you to transfer certain licenses or the businesses if it were undertaken person to the scheme. So if, if you have looked also checked with legal certainty, you've also looked at tax efficiency. Again, if you were to transfer a business from a company or you were to sell shares, a company sells shares to of, of, of a target to another company, that company will be subjected to capital gains first. And then when the company upstream this as dividend, the shareholders will be subjected to tax on the second count. So if that tax efficiency is also thought through, and you've also looked at the, the benefit, if any, in a retrospective, you know, frankly, if I've acquired a company today, and two years down the line or a year down the line if i want to merge this company with me and for taking the uh, price uh, benefit into my books or cost of acquisition into my book and capitalize that cost i would rather do that merger from the date of acquisition of that you know uh, of that uh, you know acquisition of shares of that company and and therefore uh, you know if i have the benefit of retrospective effect I would ask definitely ask a question to myself that is the scheme beneficial than doing a classical or a conventional method of MA. If I'm able to do that, my answer is please go ahead and please reach out to me. Thank you very much, Mehul, for wonderfully recapping uh, you know complex and very comprehensive topic in, in a very short span of time. 
uh, before we head towards the fag end of this, I think uh, on your slide, uh, you know, before closing, I would like to ask each of you to respond to the poll slide on your screen uh, to provide your feedback on today's webinar. Uh, we take this very seriously as part of our continuous improvement program. So, if Mitesh, you can kindly put up the poll slide, uh, which you can see it's there. Uh, this will take, we'll just wait for a minute before we kind of head towards the concluding part and there's some useful information uh, in the conclusion so please stay stay on for a few more minutes so uh, i think just to conclude uh, finally you know i would like to thank both our panel members firstly for sharing their experience uh, and expertise with us today uh, mehul and bhavin thank you so very much Without you, this webinar would not have been possible, obviously. You each did an outstanding job, uh, and we very much uh, are indebted to you. To our audience members, I hope you found this webinar an interesting and a worthwhile investment of your time. We certainly enjoyed bringing it to you. Uh, after the webinar, as I mentioned at the outset, we will send you a copy of today's presentation materials, summary notes, and a link to the webinar recording. Uh, you will also separately receive a request for your feedback on the webinar. Please take the time to send your feedback, comments, criticism, and even compliments. Uh, the form takes barely less than a minute to complete, so please do that. Uh, please do not hesitate to contact us regarding any matters uh, arising from this webinar. Our contact information is on the contact slide at the end of this webinar. Uh, and of course, it's a complicated topic, so please do reach out without any hesitation. Uh, thank you for your attendance today again and we look forward to being of service again at future webinars thank you very much and have a good day thank you thank you